How many of you believe that uh, this time of year is indeed the most wonderful time of the year? It's gifts, it's presents, it's family, it's fun, it's decorations. And you would say, amen, it is the most wonderful time of the year. Raise your hands. I am included in that. But if you'll notice, there's a lot of people who are like, not so much. Because oftentimes, as fun as this time of the year is, and I love it, Part of my heart beats for this time of the year. Part of my heart always feels sad this time of the year. It's been six years since my dad passed away, and it's one more Christmas I don't celebrate with him. And he ain't coming back from heaven. He wouldn't if he could, but I miss him every year. Many times this time of year, it's like, God, there's so much, but God, I'm also grieving this. There's, there's difficulties and struggles and pain. And although we celebrate, many of us quietly struggle as much as we celebrate. Amen? And if it's not this time of year, has there ever been a season in your life when you thought, this is not what I prayed for? Am I the only one? I'm up here all by myself. Nobody? Okay, yeah. God, are you hearing any of my prayers? God, are you awake? Are you listening? I I know that you're good, but this doesn't feel good. And that happens throughout much of the year, but it's really acute this time of year. Well, as we begin our Advent series, you're going to meet a couple that for much of their life wondered, I guess, God, are you listening? And and what we're going to read today in the book of Luke It happens after 400 years of silence. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament, and he prophesied there's one coming that's going to turn the hearts of the people back to their fathers. There's one coming, he's coming, he's coming. And then for 400 years, nothing. No book of the Bible was written, no prophet was speaking, and each generation drifted a little further from the Lord. There's still remnants of faith. But for 400 years, it was quiet. And what we're going to read today is when the silence was about to be broken. And so so open your Bibles to to Luke chapter 1, and we're going to jump in in verse 5, and I'm going to pray. Lord, I pray that even with a mixture of rejoicing and struggle, sorrow and celebration, pain and Rejoice, I pray, God, that when we wait and when it's hard and when it's good, that in all times we would worship you. So help us today to learn that you're good even when it's hard to see in Jesus' name. And everybody said? So many of you are familiar with this passage, Zechariah and Elizabeth. I love this text, and we're going to jump right in to verse 5. It says, In the days... Of King Herod, so this is the setting, and King Herod is also known as Herod the Great. Herod is the one, if you remember, who ordered the slaughter of all of the firstborn sons. When Jesus was born, everybody said, he's the king of the Jews. And Herod said, I don't want any other king, and I don't want any competition. And he ordered the slaughter of all the firstborn. That's the same one here. It continues, there was a priest of Abijah's division named Zechariah. And his wife was from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So we meet Zechariah and Elizabeth. They're very special in this story in redemptive history. Zechariah's name means the Lord remembers. Aren't you glad that the Lord doesn't have a short-term memory problem, that the Lord remembers? Amen? And Elizabeth's name means God's oath. And so God's not only a promise maker, he's a promise keeper. And Elizabeth is from the line of Aaron, so her family are priests. But Zechariah is also a priest. And during that day, there were some 20,000 almost priests throughout Israel. Now, Zechariah wasn't a big deal priest. He didn't serve regularly in the temple in Jerusalem. He was more of a small-time priest from an outlying area. And we're going to learn more about this important couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth, in verse 6 and 7. And it says both were, what's the word? Righteous in God's sight, living without blame according to all the commands and requirements of the Lord. But they had no children because Elizabeth could not conceive. And both of them 
we're well along in years. So there's at least three things we learn from these verses. Number one, we learn they're old. <laughs> the question is, well, how old are they? Well, this phrase, they were well along in years, was also used in another place in Scripture to describe Abraham and Sarah. And Paul, when he was writing to the church in Rome, in Romans 4, wanted to remind the readers of God's faithfulness to Abraham and Sarah, even though Paul wrote they were as good as dead. <laughs> Same language as well along in years. So I don't know how old as good as dead is, but it's old. If the scripture calls you as good as dead, you're, you're pretty old. So, so they're old. And Elizabeth also couldn't conceive. So she's unable to have children. She, she's barren. And emotionally, that, wow, I mean, that's devastating. Pain and heartache, even doubt throughout your entire life of wondering why the God wouldn't open your womb. And it was really acute in the first century because Elizabeth would have experienced a significant amount of disgrace because culturally people viewed someone unable to have children as a sign of sin in their life or as a sign of God's punishment on them. But the Bible says they were righteous before the Lord. Were they perfect? No. But were they unable to have kids because of sin? Not at all. Which is, at that point, not a part of God's plan. They were old like Abraham and Sarah, but they didn't take matters into their own hands like Abraham and Sarah did. If you remember the story, then Sarah told Abraham to sleep with Hagar so that they could have a son, and we all know how that worked out. But Zechariah and Elizabeth didn't do that. They, they walked with the Lord even, even when it had to have been really hard to trust him. God, are you hearing my prayers? You ever felt that? Have you ever felt the tension between walking in a faith that you believe is true, but emotionally and mentally it's really hard to get there? And Kim and I know the difficulty of not being able to have a child. I mean, if you know our story, we, we, we went through six miscarriages in seven years, praying for years, trusting God and waiting, and keep getting a no. We know what it's like to struggle with walking with the Lord and not get bitter to keep the faith and to keep worshiping and to keep serving, even though it doesn't make sense, to, to accept his plan for our life and to wait patiently, even through tears and through struggle and through waiting. When, when the waiting and the, the struggle feels like a furnace where the, the temperature just keeps heating up and you don't know if you could take it anymore. You ever been there? So, I mean, if you're waiting, if you're in the struggle and that struggle right now feels like a furnace, and if you have like sometimes more faith, or excuse me, more tears than faith, I would say welcome home. Because the scriptures say, listen, the scriptures say that they are righteous, but it doesn't say they never struggled. And in the waiting, the temptation that, that, that Kim and I felt, the temptation that I felt, the temptation that you struggle with, listen to me, the temptation in the waiting is to believe what I really need to feel whole. What I really need to feel whole is what God has yet to provide. The struggle is, man, what I really need to feel whole and complete and satisfied is what I don't have yet because God hasn't answered that prayer. And when God finally answers my prayer, then I'll be fulfilled. And the danger is you end up tired of the day-to-day -day life that God has given you. You want to escape that life. And you're not at risk of necessarily ruining your life. But you run the risk of wasting it. Because you can't be where your feet are. And just like Zachariah and Elizabeth, I can promise you God has something greater for you. God has something greater for you. And listen, that may not be something different. God may call you to do the same thing you've been doing, but in a different way and for a different reason and with a different purpose. Because I say God has something greater, and some of you hear something better. Oh, good, I was tired of this job. I want a new one. This spouse not working. I want a better one. 
Uh, when I say greater, I don't necessarily mean better. God's greater for you may be to keep, stay put right where you are, keep doing what you're doing, but with a greater passion and a purpose. It may not be something new. It may be to step up right where you are. Because God doesn't want any of us living in a spiritual survival mode. He doesn't want us in miserable mediocrity, on the grind. You know, the office cubicle is a horrible shade of gray, family dysfunction. I, I keep faking a smile the whole time. But God would say, I want to open a door to the life that you need, which may be different than the life that you're praying for. The life that you need. And Zachariah and Elizabeth, year after year, year after year, tear, tear, shame, disgrace, were faithful. And so was God. Even when they couldn't see it, he was faithful. Let's, let's keep going in the story. Verse 8. And when his division, that's Zechariah, was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, it happened, which I always think is funny, there are no coincidences, that he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. And so the priests from all the small towns twice a year would go up to Jerusalem to minister at the temple. And the temple is where God's presence dwelt in the Holy of Holies. That's where sacrifices were made to atone for sin because the Bible says without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sin. And Zechariah would have had to wait his whole life. He's old, as good as dead, before he ever got to enter the temple and be anywhere near the presence of God. His whole life was spent serving God and never got to get near the presence of God. Aren't you glad you don't have to wait? Aren't you glad that we don't need a temple or a priest that we're not still making sacrifices, that Jesus shed his own blood as our sacrifice so that we can enter into the presence of God. So Zechariah, he goes into the temple because he was chosen by lot, it says. And the priest every year would roll dice to determine who God selected to go in, serve in the temple, burn incense, and most likely pray. This was a really, really big honor for the priest that was selected. I mean, this is it. This is your national championship. This is your big day. And every year, Zechariah would go to Jerusalem. We don't know, 20, 30 years. They'd roll the dice. Nope, 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 never picked. This was like some of you in elementary school with kickball. You just never picked. And so Zechariah didn't get to go in. And he's waiting. Proverbs says that God oversees the roll of the dice. And now, Zechariah, it's, it's, it's your turn. So he would enter the temple, not into the Holy of Holies, because that was, that was reserved only for the high priest. He would go as close as a regular priest could get. And so now it's Zechariah's moment. He's, he's in the temple. He's going to go in. He's probably going to burn incense, followed by a prayer. Look at verse 11 and 12. It says, and an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of the altar of incense, verse 12. And when Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and overcome with fear. We're lucky the old guy didn't die right there on the spot. And so verse 13 and 14 says this. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. This is John the Baptist, the one that prepares the way for Jesus. And there will be joy and delight for you, and many will rejoice at his birth. Listen, God's cosmic plan of redemption that, that affects many. God's cosmic plan of redemption that touches every tribe, tongue, and nation is still carried out one life at a time, you. And so although God loves the world, this morning maybe you could experience for the first time the reality that God loves you. And God sees you, and he has a story for the world, but he also has a story for you. And I love this moment. I get so excited for Elizabeth and for Zachariah. I mean, don't you? I mean, put yourself in the story. This is not fiction. This is historical fact. And I love just thinking about it. It's an incredible story. And God says, I've heard your prayers. Here comes your son. And God's already named him John. He's going gonna, he's gonna to be the forerunner of the Messiah. Look at verse 15, 16 and 17. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord and will never drink wine or beer. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's room, 16 and 17. 
He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the understanding of the righteous to make ready for the Lord a prepared people. He's the angel is actually quoting Malachi chapter 4, the last prophecy, then 400 years of silence. Malachi said, this is going to happen. And now the angel is saying to Gabriel, right now, this is it. Just like the Holy Spirit filled Elijah, he's going to fill your boy. And just like Elijah was a prophet, your boy is going to be a prophet. And at this point, just like many of us, we should learn when to stop talking. <laughs> Because at this moment, Zechariah should have just went, woo and went home. But he doesn't. And he starts talking. Look at verse 18. How, Zechariah says, can I know this, Zechariah? asked the angel. For I am an old man. And look at Zechariah's wisdom. And my wife is well along in years. He doesn't call her an old woman, does he? You can say all you want about Zechariah, but my boy is sharp. Basically, he says she's really no spring chicken. That's what it means in the Greek right there. Now, apparently, the miraculously appearing angel wasn't enough for Zechariah. And you can go back and review. Let's look. Zechariah, the dice fell in your way. You're in the temple. God sent you an angel. Do you see the wings? But, but I'm old, and my wife is well advanced in years. I would imagine the angel's like, you know, I had no idea. You know, we angels are not so good with the age thing, Right? And we can laugh and poke fun a little bit at Zechariah, but what's happening here is that Zechariah's response to Gabriel shows that he had given up on the prayer that he and Elizabeth had once prayed for so long for a child. He, he, didn't, he didn't have it in him anymore. And Mary, a little bit later in Luke, when the angel tells her, hey, you, the Son of God's going to inside of you. She asked, how can this be? But her question was one of faith. Okay, I believe really, based on what she's saying. Can you, can you just tell me how it's going to happen? I believe it can. Can you tell me how? Zacharias is a, is a question of doubt. Whoa, time out. This is why it isn't, isn't true for me. Look at verse 19. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel who stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. There's only two angels listed by name in the Bible, Michael and Gabriel. You get one of them. It's a really big day. And Gabriel, right here, this is emphatic in the Greek. He says, I'm Gabriel, and I'm talking, and you're listening. And I stand in the presence of God. You know the Holy of Holies that you are not allowed to go in? I was just there. God told me to come and tell you this. So listen, verse 20. Now listen. You will become silent and unable to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. It's the First biblical case of a massive timeout. You don't get to speak anymore. And the promise goes out, and Zechariah struggles to believe. And you can ridicule Zechariah all you want. But if you're honest, you play a very similar game as well. There are moments when the promises of God seem far too difficult to believe in your life where we have seasons of our life where we tell God why his promises can't be true for us. This, this is my situation, God. This is why it can't work for me. This is why it won't work for me. This is why it's not true for me. This is exactly what Zechariah does. This is why it can't be true for me. And we've all been guilty of this, of saying God's promise isn't true because of fill in the blank, whatever your situation is. This is my past. This is my story. This is why it's too broken. This is why it's unfixable. This is whatever it is. And what you're doing in that moment is not only are you lying to yourself, what you're saying is that God's power isn't as big as your circumstance. And so we've all been guilty of that. And let me be clear about what happened to, to Zechariah. God doesn't tell Gabriel, hey, zap that dude. 
because he's mad at him. And God loves him. And because he loves him, he lovingly disciplines him. Zachariah's not going to stay quiet forever. When he's born, he explodes in worship, and he sings, and he dances and he spits out poetry. This is God's temporary discipline, not because he's full of wrath, but because he's full of love. And so as we keep reading, look, look what happens. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah. He's probably been in there longer than they thought he should be. Amazed that he stayed so long in the sanctuary. And when he did come out, he couldn't speak to them. I mean, think about the story when this happens. Then they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He was making signs to them and remained speechless. And when the days of his ministry were completed, he went back home. And so they're wondering, where is he? He comes out. He can't talk. Somehow they communicate. Another priest probably finishes the ceremony. And then Zechariah goes home, and I would have loved to be in the living room when Zechariah comes home, unable to speak, and tries to explain to Elizabeth what's going on. Like, what an incredible moment that must have been. And we, we learn more about Elizabeth in, in the last two verses here of this passage. And after these days, <clears throat> his wife Elizabeth conceived. And kept herself in seclusion for five months. She said, the Lord has done this for me. He has looked with favor, underline that word, in these days to take away my disgrace among the people. I, I love this picture of Elizabeth. Because what does Elizabeth do? Nothing really for five months. She's just worshiping God and rubbing her belly and setting up the nursery and rejoicing that her husband can't talk, you know? <laughs> it's just, God, thank you for a baby and a mute husband. This is <laughs> remarkable. But I love this picture of Elizabeth. She says, the Lord has looked on me with favor. That's, that's the same word for grace. You, you didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. God just chose to give you grace. Aren't you glad God's a God of grace? Like that same grace is available in your life, not only for salvation that you can't earn, you'll never lose, but every moment of your life, there's grace. There's grace. She's like, God's grace. She didn't say, we were faithful for all those years, and now finally we got what we deserve. No. It was God's grace. His grace. And, and what his grace did was take away her disgrace, which is like being reviled. And that's, that's what Elizabeth would have felt for much of her life. As I said, wanting children is not only painful, but in the first century, it's compounded by a society that judges you and thinks something's wrong with you and there's a sin issue with you, and that's why this can't happen. And so now she, she not only feels God's grace, but she feels the removal of her disgrace. It's so beautiful. Had God cursed Zachariah and Elizabeth at any point in their life with the delay of his answer? Had he? No. He was working out his plan that said, later. And they finally got to experience his grace. And the removal of the disgrace. And, and Jesus, and Jesus alone provides that for us. Through his gift of salvation, we get his grace and we get the removal of our shame and disgrace. And from that moment on, we belong to God and we are his. And the Bible says he is for us and no weapon formed against us will prosper and so in a season right now where if you, you belong to him and you know that is true, but you're wondering, like, what if my story doesn't end with a pretty nice, neat little bow on it like Zachariah and Elizabeth? Because their son, John the Baptist, his life doesn't end with a pretty little bow on it. In fact, he ends up being beheaded by King Herod. And so what, what do you do when there's, there's, there's not a bow or it doesn't work out the way that you think? What do you do? 
The question is, when it's not working out or it doesn't work out, are you confident that even in that, God loves you? If you've been wounded by hope, can you, can you keep a remnant alive that says, no, God, no, I know, I know what is true. What I feel isn't true, but what I know is true. There's no Christian bumper sticker that'll answer those moments, but what I've been able to do with my life in all of these years with my wife is to say, baby, in every moment, and she will say it to me, I'm going to take every ounce of my life and put it into the hands of God. I'm going to take every ounce of my life and put it in the hands of God, believing that over time, we're going to see God's hands in every ounce of our life. If I don't see it today, it's not because it's not there. It's because I just don't see it. And if I'm doubting today, it doesn't mean he's not good. It's just another reason to lean in. And so if you, if you learn from Zachariah and Elizabeth today, you learn that, man, there are others who have walked through this journey that know exactly what it's like to day in and day out wonder, hey, why me and why this and why now? And God has something greater for you. He has a door open to the life that you need. It may not be what you're praying for or how you're praying for it, but God has a life of flourishing faith for you, even in the midst of pain. I want to invite you into that. I want to call you into that. There's a God who sees you. There's a God who loves you, who knows you. And today he wants to minister to you. And I just want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I want you to take a moment right now, and I want you to place your thoughts on the one area of life where doubt creeps in, where pain is alive, where uncertainty would reign. And would you just confess it to the Lord? If he's powerful enough to save you, he's big enough to listen right now. Pray for strength to say it is well. Pray for grace to walk. Pray for endurance. That's why Paul calls this faith a journey of, en of endurance. It is a long race. And so if you're weary today, welcome home. If you're struggling today, welcome home. Say that to the Lord. I'm weary. I'm tired. I hurt. And you don't have to pray for him to be good to you or to be gracious to you. Ask him to just help you see it. Faith to wait. Endurance in the furnace. And I, as you're praying, I want to encourage those of you who are here, and if you have been through the furnace, if you've walked through the fire, there are other people that need your testimony of God's goodness that People who are newer in the faith or are wondering, is it worth it to walk all those years through this journey, even when it's hard? The, the church and the world needs people to stand up and say, he's good, and it doesn't matter what, and it doesn't matter when or how. I love him, and I'll follow him. I pray that you would be bold in declaring God's goodness with your life. And so, Lord, we praise you. We worship you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.